Hello, and welcome to Ithaca DSA Presents. My name is David Foote. I'm an activist and organizer with the local chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. I'm joined today by Dana Brown, who's director of the Next System Project at the Democracy Collaborative, a think do tank for the democratic economy. Dana does research and policy development about health and care systems, the pharmaceutical se sector, and economic transformation for health and well being. Yes, yeah, so we wanted to talk to you today about a topic that Sounds very interesting. I'll admit, I don't know a lot about it yet, um, about public ownership and public production of pharmaceuticals. Medicine of, is of course a topic that comes up a lot on the left, given the, the truly horrific state of our healthcare industry. But a lot of these conversations tend to focus on things like medical debt, people's um, butting heads with their private insurance systems, racial inequalities in access and quality of care, um, understaffing of hospitals or, or suppression of nurses unions, all these other issues that are kind of more connected to point of care um, or even to labor struggles. As socialists, our goal is to make sure that things like healthcare, as well as housing, education, and other things are public goods, that they're available to everyone. So can you talk to us a little bit about how this, this principle of public production, whether you call it socialism or just sort of something that's in the public interest, how does that apply to the production of medicine? Well, I think you already framed it perfectly by using that term public good. For me, that's really the starting point is to recognize medicine and medical knowledge as a form of public good, both in that broad sense that it's really beneficial to the public as a whole to have access to medicine and medical technology and that there are positive externalities beyond you know, me or you getting to take an individual treatment that we need, right? It keeps us in the workforce, it allows us to be part of a thriving community and contribute in other ways. Um, but also a public good in this economic sense, right? That medical knowledge can and should be both non-rivalrous and non-excludable to use the silly terms. But for an example, that's really relevant right now. Think about the recipe for a COVID-19 vaccine. Having one lab use that recipe to produce some vaccines doesn't mean that the recipe gets used up and it can never be utilized again, right? We, it's not a finite research resource. The recipe can and should be made broadly available so that the world can produce as many vaccines as it needs to save lives and control the pandemic. So if, if we start from that idea that essential medicine should be treated like a public good, then even putting aside one's political tendencies, our concerns about justice and equity, simple economics 101 tells us that markets aren't well-placed to produce public goods. If we want public goods, we need to look for other forms of provision. And in fact, you know, basic economics says whenever you see monopolies, externalities, information asymmetries, or public goods, that's when states should intervene because markets aren't good at, at fixing those things. Well, in the pharmaceutical industry right now, we have all of those issues. So it makes a really strong case for a much greater public role. Um, and I think as we continue to talk, you'll see, we believe at the Democracy Collaborative that there are also strong arguments for why public production of pharmaceuticals would not only contribute to better economic outcomes like lower all overall drug prices and reduced disparities in access to medicines, but also better outcomes for health and democracy, right? Um, and I guess just to, to you know, kind of end this first bit, really to start, we can think about the main difference between public and private ownership, right? As opposed to big pharma companies, publicly owned pharmaceuticals wouldn't have to engage in profit maximization and rent seeking. They don't have to extract, right? Thus, they can define their bottom line in a different way um, about in terms of contributions to public health, scientific advancement, and local economic benefit and resilience. That opens up a whole bunch of possibilities for industrial strategy and public health planning designed from the beginning to really have broad and equitable benefits. So it's really, it's a whole different way 
of thinking and planning for providing something that is essential for a healthy and wealthy, right, thriving society. Yeah, you mentioned the role that profit plays, and that is an angle I wanted to bring up. Uh, my understanding is that um, a lot of companies focus on producing drugs that will bring in the most money, not what's most important to public health, what's essential. It, it kind of narrows the focus um, towards what will make them money. Can you talk about the effects of this, how public ownership will not just allow us to sort of holistically look at what's, what's needed across the board, but this, how, how would this actually address inequalities as well? Yeah, that's a great question. So just real quickly to look at sort of the problem that we see today, right? Big pharma companies, like all large corporations, are designed to principally do one thing, and that's maximize profits, right? That's to make your shareholders happy. And, you know, the way the market works, that means pretty quick returns. You need to be doing better every quarter. So that really introduces some kind of noxious incentives into the medicine system when we're relying only on private companies to create medicine. So as you say, big pharma tends to focus on things like drugs for chronic diseases, like heart disease or high blood pressure, where you know you can sell the pill over and over and over again because people need to take it for an extended period of time. And that leaves out things that are curative or preventative. So antibiotics, which the world desperately needs new antibiotics because bacteria has evolved. They're, they're good at that. Um, and we need preventative things like vaccines that in general, the market is really not good at producing. And in fact, before the pandemic, uh, pharmaceutical companies had been dropping their va vaccine units in droves. Um, so there really is a, an awful lot of medicine that just doesn't get developed by uh, industry that's only interested in maximizing profits. Um, and again, if we create public sector entities to produce medications, from the beginning, they can be designed differently because there's not a profit to maximize. The objectives can be right, filling in the gaps. The objectives can be to forward research in neglected areas, to forward research in places that um, you know, a, affect marginalized communities more. So, right, focus on sickle cell, focus on tropical diseases, focus on, on new antibiotics. Um, the metrics can be different from the beginning and the way that we, the public engage with this institution, you know, through multi-stakeholder boards and, you know, the transparency and accountability initiatives that we can really build in from the beginning means that it, they can be our institutions and we can hold them accountable and, right, we can help steward a process that really creates the medicines that we need and the workplace that we need for the future that we want. Um, right now we're in the situation where we've been told that big pharma is the only game in town, right? They're the only folks capable of creating new drugs. Therefore we are at their mercy, you know, whatever they want to create or not create, whatever they want to charge, that's it. First of all, this is actually patently untrue because the public sector and nonprofits around the world have developed new drugs before and continue to do that. But just sort of the way the model works now, um, and we'll get into this in a second probably, especially with the way intellectual property is treated, that all tends to live with private companies and then it gets kind of locked up in an enclosure and it's hard for the public to access. So we really think that public pharmaceuticals, particularly if they do research and development, can address a whole bunch of these issues, right? Not only proactively prioritizing what we need for the greatest public and population health, but also keeping the intellectual property on all those new developments in the public domain and not allowing it to be, you know, a private entity that you have to ask for access to. Um, and then third, right, public sector pharmaceuticals can be a source of good public sector jobs that are in and of themselves an upstream investment in population health, right? Having stable jobs and having good jobs is actually good for community health. So we, we see a lot of benefits here by doing medicine in the public sector and especially doing it in a way that is democratized and held to account by the very people that these institutions are supposed to serve. And how would you say this compares to approaches that the government has taken in the past? I think of things like grants to research institutions, government funding of the sciences. Um, for some reason, this sort of in my mind brings to mind like old mid 20th century 
short videos of, of people in lab coats stirring things around. Um, so, but that is kind of a limited knowledge of the history of medicine that I have, but was it, was it different in the 20th century? Were, were there advances made then that um, sort of austerity has taken away from us? How does our history compare to our present and our potential future? Yeah, great question. And of course it depends what point in American history we're talking about. Um, but certainly the past, the, the, the past, you know, form of development of medications and the provision of medicine in, the America, in America and around the world was different than the present we're living. And the future can be what we make of it. So um, very quickly, I think that the present that we live in now is really informed by a number of changes that started in the late 70s and, and really kind of took off in 1980 with the passage of the Bayh-Dole Act, which essentially allows for publicly funded interventions in medicine and beyond to be patented and privatized. Um, and that really kind of sets off a whole process that dramatically changes the incentives in the industry and really shapes the modern pharmaceutical sector and the, the market. Um, the journalist uh, Alexander Zaitchek has done some phenomenal work documenting all of that history and all of kind of the closed door conversations that, that led to it um, and has some wonderful pieces out in the New Republic and, and, and other places and is working on a book about it. It's, it's, a, it's a long and, and fraught history, but it really also does show us, you know, in the past, in the United States and elsewhere, right? Most vaccines were developed, manufactured and distributed entirely in the public sector. It can be done. It's been done a lot of times. It can be done again. Um, and, you know, in the past, but also in the present, the public sector is a major, if not the principal funder of biomedical research in the United States and around the world. The National Institutes of Health, a federal public institution here in, in Bethesda, Maryland, um, is the largest funder of biomedical research in the world and you know, made massive contributions to the COVID vaccines and other um, and treatments and whatnot. Uh, another really you know, kind of fascinating cautionary tale is, is insulin, which was developed in a public lab in Canada. Um, the inventors didn't want to patent it because they thought of it as a public good but they were convinced that they needed the help of a, of a private company to scale up and to market this impressive um, invention in the United States. And that private company, along with a couple others who come in later on, have managed to now keep insulin, most insulins, on patent for over a hundred years. There are three companies that dominate the world market and control the supply and the price of something that is, you know, and totally essential medicine that that type one diabetics, for instance, can't live without. So, you know, it's the public sector can and does, and we can we can move to a model that empowers the public sector to do more and share more with all of us. Um, but that the moment we're living in now is is really really colored by sort of the last forty years of. Um, the dominant paradigm of economic thinking. Um, you know, a lot of those public labs that I mentioned that used to make vaccines were privatized because that was just the thinking of the day was, you know, this is going to be a more efficient. But I think now we have a big body of evidence that says not only is this not economically efficient, it's not equitable, it's not meeting our goals as a society, um, and, and it's costing an awful lot to, you know, to the public in many ways, and it's costing lives. Talking about those costs, um, one of the programs that DSA has been very active in promoting and organizing around is the idea of Medicare for All, which is sort of a, a name for a single payer system that we would like to see. And one of the benefits I've heard touted for Medicare for All would be the ability for the government to nego negotiate the price of prescription drugs, uh, which would limit some of that price gouging um, that we see as a result of privatization. So how might um, the ability of governments to negotiate prices with existing private corporations, how might that slot alongside of public production of pharmaceuticals? Yeah, fantastic. That, that's a great question and, and really exciting. And I think you're right that, you know, Medicare for all would be a boon to the country in terms of things like negotiating better drug prices. Um, to be overly simplistic, in one word, I'd say what public pharma gets us vis-a-vis -vis Medicare for all is leverage, right? As soon as big pharma is not the only game in town, 
then the public sector has much more leverage to negotiate prices with the and and other conditions with the private sector. I mean, we could negotiate conditions that say, not only am I not going to pay you three hundred dollars a pop for those vials of insulin anymore, um, you're going to have to share that intellectual property so that more manufacturers can make uh, insulin and that there's more resilience in the supply chain. Right, I mean, extraordinary amount of leverage. But as we spoke about before, we also have missing medications right now. We have really important things that the world needs that we're not getting out of private industry. And if the public sector starts to do that, if we invest in new antibiotics and drugs for emerging threats, right, we're also going to be providing the medications that we need now and in the future. Um, it, we're also going to have a better ability to sort of so sort out what we do and don't need from the private sector. At the moment, we have a, a glut of what we call me too drugs, which are new medic medications that are just new enough. They have small tweaks um, on top of existing medications, just enough to get them a patent, but they don't introduce any new clinical benefit to patients. And they often introduce new risks. Again, as soon as we break big pharma's monopoly and they're not the only place in the world that you can get medications, it changes the balance of power and it also opens up a lot of political space to do other things, like get some of that money out of politics, right? The, the uh, reform regulations, right? That reform the FDA, if, if they're not 100% dependent on fees from big pharma companies to do their work. So it just really opens things up, I think, and, and creates a lot more space for the public interest in healthcare broadly. And, and very quickly, I'd say, um, you know, I think it's not just theoretical that we'd have uh, leverage in conversations with uh, pharmaceutical companies. Places like Brazil and Thailand that do have um, a public generic drug manufacturing facilities, they've used that leverage in negotiations with big pharma companies and it's been documented that they got better prices on antiretrovirals than when they went into negotiations because they said, oh, okay, well, we'll just make the copies ourselves. So, you know, th this works and there are really successful examples that we can build from. A, a difficulty I think we face in movement building, generally speaking, is that people have kind of low trust in the government as well. And I think this is due to a political project, austerity, intentional cutbacks, um, a, a program to lower people's trust in the government and deregulate as a result. Do you see any difficulty then in creating these big new government programs in the current landscape? And on the other hand, what's the potential for showing people what the government can do for them? I think first and foremost, I mean, that's why I talk about the public and not, you know, the government in a sense, because what, what we are really about is figure out what we need and then trying to build it. So um, for me, public is a necessary but insufficient condition for the kind of pharmaceutical you know, institutions that I wanna see in the future. I want them to be public, but also democratized, um, right? They need to be designed from the beginning so that they are embedded in community that, that you know, not only the workers in, in a, a manufacturing facility or in an R&D lab, right? feel and have ownership and participate in the process, but the broader community, right, recognize that as an institution is able to participate in the board or in oversight or in, you know, the transparency hearings is, is helpful in the process of holding that institution to account, but also helping it continue to learn and get better. Um, you know, and we have interesting models for that, that I think we can build from and integrate and learn and continue to iterate. Um, the Veterans Health Administration or uh, community health centers, the federally qualified community health centers, which there are you know, a few thousand of, I think, around the country, have multi-stakeholder boards where two thirds of the board is community members from the local community that is being served. Um, and I think that there's those sorts of models. The, the Veterans Health Administration is very transparent and held to account by Congress, the, the GAO, by veterans service organizations, uh, by you know, reporting requirements. And I think we, we take all of the best of that and we say, if we're going to create a new thing in the public sector, in the public interest, and it's going to make this critical good for people and for the future of our economy, that, you know, resilience and health and wealth of the nation, then we, then we do it right. We democratize it from the beginning. Um, 
and I think that's also, a, a, you know, part of that's political strategy too, right? The more that a community is a part of that public institution and not only literally owns it because it's it's ours, it's the public, we own it through, you know, the jurisdiction, um, but is a part and feels ownership, then, then it's embedded, then people defend it. I, I mean, I think it's very illustrative to look back a few years and, and remember that Obama tried to privatize the Tennessee Valley Authority, a public institution that creates electricity. And, so, and local people and politicians, including several Republican politicians, said, no, you can't privatize that because they feel ownership, because they see it doing something positive in the community, because they'd get political backlash if they allowed that revered institution, which is imperfect, but, but, but you know, I think that's how to, we have to think about the public institutions of the future is not far off things, you know, centralized in, in DC and top down. No, that, why can't we have a, a public, pharmaceutical manufacturer owned by the city of New York, where there's participatory budgeting and a multi-stakeholder board. And, and, you know, one of the people on the board is their new, um, a, they have a new office that has a, you know, health equity professional. And fantastic, right? There, there's a whole bunch of ways that we can structure the public sector to really reflect the public's that make up this nation. And I think that's, it's incumbent upon us to find those design features and to build institutions that naturally create the outcomes we want rather than trying to take an institution that isn't fit for purpose and, and keep saying, could you do the thing now that you're not really designed to do? And I, I feel like that's where we get stuck a lot of times, right? So that's, you know, we can talk forever about this, but I think, yeah, we have to, to rethink the public sector and remake it in the image of all of us. I like that. Uh, democratization is definitely the goal for, for all of these parallel programs. Um, and as you say, it may not be that far off. My understanding is there is a bill in committee here in New York, Senate Bill S-9020, the New York Affordable Drug Manufacturing Act of 2020. Can you tell us about this bill and, and where it stands right now? I was certainly aware of the bill when it was um, first introduced and some of the folks who were behind bringing that idea to the attention of New York state um, politicians. Um, so I, I don't know the details of where it's at at the moment. Really, all I can say is I can speak to sort of the principles behind that, right? It was um, type one diabetics in New York City who said, you know, the way things work right now is that we can only get our insulin from one of three companies and they jack up the prices every year. And, you know, this should be a public good and it doesn't make sense. And so they were kind of looking around for alternatives and linked up with us and other people who had been thinking about, you know, and looking at models for public sector a development and production of medications. And we had done some studies about, you know, state level public manufacturing and had even produced a legal memo for the state of California that said, you know, here are various ways that a new public manufacturer could be constituted and here are the ways you could design the boards and all that and here are some precedents. Um, and then, you know, suddenly people got the attention of somebody in the New York State Senate who's definitely already interested in healthcare, and they said, yeah, this lines up. So I think, you know, what I know is just that that it's part of kind of a, a movement to reclaim medicine as a public good and, and, you know, think of the institutions that we need in the future that could really provide public services rather than trying to shoehorn the private sector into doing something that it's not designed to do. And, yeah. and also to say, it's not the only place where there are bills. Um, there is legislation in California that at the moment creates a public um public pharmaceutical kind of retail label, and it leaves the door open to later doing public manufacturing. There's a bill in Washington state. So there's several initiatives and it really seems that it's this kind of moment and the pressure that patients are putting on politicians has sort of gotten a lot of people to see that, you know, the pharmaceutical sector is sort of ripe for disruption and maybe, you know, California or New York or Idaho is going to be the first one to disrupt that and say, you know, we're going to do what the people of our state really need us to do here. Yeah, I think that brings us back to some practical examples of, of where and how this is working. Because um, when I when I was reading about this, I saw it as being similar to a lot of things that we support as socialists that are treated as aspirational or unrealistic or um, 
raise the question, how are you going to pay for that? But we see other countries already doing some of these things and doing them well. Um, other places we should look to as examples of public pharmaceutical production um, the way we could do? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, everything is context dependent. And I think if we created a public pharmaceutical industry in the United States, it would look slightly different than public pharmaceutical industries in other places. And that that's, that's good. We'd adapt it to our needs and to our strengths. Um, but there's certainly ample examples. Um, the one place that really typifies kind of public medicine is Cuba. Uh, certainly the entire pharmaceutical industry was nationalized um, at, during the revolution. So Cuba does what we think of as sort of the, the whole supply chain and the full sector, I'm sorry, full cycle development of new medications. They, they research and they create new medications, including a couple of COVID vaccines, which are in the final stages of being approved right now, um, and cancer immunotherapies and other medicines. They do that, but they also produce, they manufacture drugs, both um, what we think of chemical drugs, sort of like pills that you take and biologics, which are much more complex like vaccines. Um, and they distribute them in the public sector. And they're quite successful even under severe resource constraints because of the embargo. Um, you know, not only they, they meet the majority of domestic demand, they export medications, they have lots of international patents. The, um, locally in Cuba, all of the intellectual property is held sort of in a common, trot, like a patent pool that is sort of commons based, uh, but internationally they do license medications and sell to other countries. So, um, you know, that's an incredible example, but a number of countries, Brazil, Thailand, India, China, and a number of others do um, some public sector manufacturing of medicines. A, Sweden does public sector distribution. There are all sorts of interesting ways and different starting points. South Korea has public contract manufacturing where the, the country provides manufacturing facility capacity and it supports small and medium enterprise in biotechs. It supports new small businesses by giving them, you know, sort of the startup right, capital and space to, 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 to work. So really a whole bunch of different um, successful examples designed to meet specific local needs. And I think we can learn from that and, and build, you know, based on the needs of our country in this moment. Is there a website or other resource that folks could do, go to if they wanted to learn a little bit more? Sure, I'll, I'll give you two. The nextsystem.org and publicmedicines.org. Um, which have an awful lot of content on these issues and more. This has been Ithaca DSA Presents. I'm David Foote. I was joined today by Dana Brown, Director of the Next System Project at the Democracy Collaborative. Mm -hmm.